So uh, my first question for you is, how is Alzheimer's currently detected and treated? And why don't we have yet drugs that can effectively treat and prevent the development of the disease? Alzheimer's disease is a clinical diagnosis, but it's also a pathological diagnosis. So how we detect Alzheimer's pathology that causes uh, clinical impairment is by measuring two proteins. One is amyloid, is a protein that is normally expressed in the brain, uh, but when Alzheimer's disease starts developing, it gets retained and it aggregates in the brain. The other protein is tau. It starts changing conformation um, and it is thought to be very toxic to the brain. Um, and we initially developed methods to detect both of these in cerebral spinal fluid. Next, we developed molecular PET ligands in order to be able to detect them in, with PET imaging. And last, and I think um, this is one of the most exciting technological advancements of perhaps our century, I'm gonna say decade for sure, uh, is that now we are able to detect them in blood. What this means is that we, are, we for the first time, have the chance to really detect um, the Alzheimer's disease neuropathology at, at a population level, and we're able to, um, to screen because uh, these tests are much less expensive and they are certainly non-invasive. Why we don't have treatments is because we were detecting pathology uh, by doing lumbar punctures on people uh, because we had to quantify in cerebral spinal fluid or PET scans and so I think we were not detecting it early enough. We were doing these rather invasive or expensive tests on individuals who came in symptomatic from the disease. And like many other diseases, cancer and cardiovascular disease, you don't want to intervene when, when the symptoms are really severe. But now that we can detect it based on screening tests, we stand for the first, chance, uh, for the first time to develop uh, really um, game-changing therapies. Another answer to that is that these are very good biomarkers of pathology, but they may not be the earliest etiology of disease. So they mark the disease state, but we can't just go after them. They're great biomarkers. It doesn't mean that going after them is gonna stop the disease. So I think as a field, we're starting to think about disease under different angles, and that's also going to lead to um, new, novel, innovative um, treatments. So you've mentioned how these biomarkers help us detect that the disease is in its early stages or developing, but can they also help us develop and identify a new therapeutic target for these uh, disorders? Absolutely. So I think what is going to help us identify new therapeutic targets are actually not just these two proteins because they mark the disease state. But now we have, uh, through technological advancements, we can measure thousands of proteins, we can measure thousands of metabolites, we can, we can do lipidomics. So we're doing a lot of omics, which at some point as a field we thought, this is fishing expedition. But you know when you don't understand a disease from a therapeutic angle, you need to fish. And what we're doing is we are still being hypothesis driven in that we're not going to look at everyone who walks this earth. We're going to design studies. We're going to select based on, say, genetic risk and compare high genetic risk to low genetic risk and then do these uh, molecular omics um, quantifications and then apply machine learning, AI, uh, new analytical methods to discover what are the dysregulations that are associated with clinical symptoms or these two markers of pathology. And so we're basically going to be able to see what we didn't use, we couldn't see. Um, and, and this is really uh, revolutionary because we don't need to go from one hypothesis to another. We get to ask the data to tell us where the problems are and then design mechanistic studies around those to understand exactly uh, why these molecular uh, abnormalities are leading to disease. Um, so I, I would like to ask you to further uh, expand your answer on the potential use of artificial intelligence in this context. I mean, obviously you have large amounts of data, more than we were able to collect in the past, and it sounds like that is potentially where AI might give us an edge against the disease. Can you please elaborate on that? Yeah. So my lab specifically, I mean, I think there are a lot of different kinds of uses um, because you can feed all sorts of data uh, to these uh, artificial intelligence pipelines. Uh, what we do is, is a lot of proteomics. We do it in human biospecimen. That's blood, cerebral spinal fluid, brain tissue. 
And uh, what uh, AI is helping us discover is molecular signatures of disease as a starting point. So you get, you know, for instance, 50 proteins that get to separate your disease group from the non-disease group. Um, and then we start looking at the functions of these proteins and what molecular pathways are they uh, regulating and what does that mean for cellular function and then also use AI to tell us how would you uh, regain homeostasis in this uh, pathway or cellular function and what could be potentially um, FDA approved drugs that you could actually use to do that. So all of these require a lot of data crunching and um, artificial intelligence, machine learning methods have significantly accelerated this process. So for the development of new drugs uh, at the stage of clinical trials, uh, it is often necessary to engage the help of patients who volunteer to participate. So why is it important for patients to enroll in these studies, even if it's not for the purpose of testing a new drug? And is this easier now that you have less invasive and easier tests that you can apply to patients? Several reasons. I would I would first um, maybe start with the um, um, technical reason. So, you know, disease. Um, so one of the maybe it's no longer a secret. Alzheimer's disease is not just one disease. It is an end stage that a lot of different um, diseases share. You know, the accumulation of these two toxic proteins. But there are many paths to getting there. And if we want to intervene on disease early, we need to understand the many different kinds of therapeutics that we need to utilize. Um, and so diversity in research, you know, um, looking as, at as many humans as possible to understand the many faces of disease is really critical because otherwise we're going to end up with, you know, generic treatments that are going to treat some people uh, with larger effect and maybe actually have more side effects than benefit to some others. So represent, representation and diversity is really key. Um, the other aspect is, is this is a true partnership. You know, we are working on, on awful human diseases for humans. And um, I, I run a lab uh, with, uh, with um, some physician scientists, but, but a lot of just scientists who don't see patients in clinic. And it gives them great motivation to meet people um, that are affected or at risk for disease. And it sort of gives them that sense of purpose of working on something very important. So there's also that um, aspect of partnership and, and collaboration. Um, and ultimately, I think we are using these less expensive, non-invasive tools that allow us to look at thousands of individuals instead of hundreds or tens uh, of individuals. Okay, and then for my final question, um, what is the timeline that you expect we'll see more effective therapeutics uh, for the treatment of these disorders? I'm going to give it a decade for having decent therapies, you know, therapies that, that significantly slow down the progression of disease. And then we need to understand a whole lot more about aging, the aging process that causes so many chronic diseases, I think in order to have ultimately cures uh, for dementia. But um, because our new technology um, alongside our new um, analytical methods have accelerated research so much, I would say what we have done in my lab in the past year is the equivalent of what we would have done four years, um, uh, in, in, in the span of four years. So for all these reasons, I'm going to be uh, cautiously optimistic and say that under a decade we're going to have therapies. Fantastic. Uh, any closing remarks before we conclude? Um, it's been really a pleasure to participate in this festival and hear not just from scientists and doctors but uh, from thinkers across all sectors of society and to think about the big problems, uh, dementia being one of them. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Elahi, for all that uh, thoughtful and careful consideration of our answers and thank you for joining us. Thank you.